Good morning. Thank you for providing the music of the morning as we gathered. The uh, noise and the, the um, exchanges between all of you were uh, wonderful music to the ears. And I really believe God sees it that way too. Uh, before we begin, though, I do want to, I've been authorized to say something about this. Um, one of the reasons the air is on a lot is we're trying to maintain healthy air in the, in the auditorium. Um, one of the results of COVID uh, research was the fact that we do exchange germs from the back to the front and all around uh, in an enclosure. And so we're trying to circulate air. But we also realize there's a problem with hearing. Uh, that's been pointed out as well. So I guess I would just at this point like to say uh, we're going to try and run as much air as we can, but we also realize there's a challenge with hearing sometimes with the background noise um, of the fans running, which there is, a, there is a, a solution to that too, which would be an automatic rollover to a lower speed fan that blows less volume but still circulates air. But I don't need, know if we need to go to those things, but, but we're working on trying to keep the healthiest air that we can while we're worshiping together. And then when we sing, we really spread germs, which is, I don't want, you have, but I'd love to see you every Sunday. So that's the challenge. As we begin this morning, we're glad for each one of you being here. We're glad for the energy that comes as we gather. We're glad for the, uh, faces that come on occasion when they're not in school. Uh, we're glad for the faces that come from Mississippi. We're glad for uh, each one of you being here, both in the building and by electronic means. One of the things we're gonna look at today is change. And how do we change? How do we, how do we adapt to what we need to be doing? And uh, we're gonna spend some time doing that. So you'll have to bear with me. I'm going to do one of those walking kids times too again, and we'll see how it goes. Um, other than that, I think that's all. But we're glad to see you as we gather. And I have a call to worship I'd like to share with you. And uh, it, it took me a long time to think that this could actually be a Bible. That sounds sacrilegious, doesn't it? But you know what? What is the Bible? A book. In a sense, it's just a book, right? Well, in that book, it is many stories that take us to this change idea we're talking about today, this, this experience that Elisha had. And it's in that book. But it's also in this and probably in all languages of the world that have been printed. So just maybe we, Randy needs to change his mind a little bit about bringing his iPad to church instead of the book. I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but I just want to challenge us to think about that as we, as we journey through life, as Elisha journeyed through his life. For a call to worship, We come from the chaos of the world, seeking to be centered in God. We come from the confusion of the world, seeking the truth of God. We come from the foolishness of the world, seeking the wisdom of God. We come from the hunger of the world, seeking the nourishment of God. We come from the violence of the world, seeking the peace of God. We gather together now with God and with each other. May God bless our time of worship. Shall we pray together? God of the unexpected, as we worship together, let our minds be open to your foolishness. 
which is wiser than human wisdom. Let us rest in your weakness, which is far stronger than human strength. Amen. May we be blessed as we worship together this morning. Kirk. Number 138 in your uh, voices together, Christ we do all adore thee. This is one of those songs that I have to resist the urge to sing every Sunday. But I figured it's been a while so we can use it again. Number 138. Christ we do all adore thee. We do all adore thee, and we do praise thee forever. For on the holy cross hast thou the world from sin redeemed. Christ, we do all adore. Number 495, um, we're looking at a week of um, extreme heat and a rather uncomfortable week, but it's a week of, that God has created, God is creating, and this song is about God's creation and God's uh, care for all of us through the best and the worst of times. Number 495, morning has broken. Morning has broken like the first morning. Margaret has spoken. for the singing, praise for the morning, praise for them springing fresh from the womb. Sweet the rain's new fall, sunlit from the sweetness of the wet garden sprung in completeness where God's feet pass mine is the sunlight mine is the Number 34 in Voices Together, we praise you, our, O God, our Redeemer. We praise you, O God, our Redeemer, Creator, in grateful devotion, our tribute we bring. We 
lay it before you. We kneel and adore you. We bless your holy name. Glad praise as we sing. We worship you, God of our ancestors' stories. Through trial and tempest, companion and guide. When perils overtake us, you will not forsake us. But faithful to your promise, you walk by our side. With voices united, our praises we offer, and gladly our songs of thanksgiving we raise. Our sins now confessing, we pray for your blessing. To you, our great Redeemer, forever be praised. We have a special time prepared, I think, this morning. Uh, Jessica, are you, as you come forward, uh, we want to recognize a person in our midst. And uh, I'm going to let Jessica handle that. Um, Sherry, we'll invite you to come forward too. But Jessica, I think you would like to uh, take charge of this part. Um, if you've looked at the bulletin this morning, you might be a little confused why we are singing a song of blessing that we often use at the end of worship here towards the beginning. The reason we are doing that is because today we have a special opportunity to bless a sister of ours, Sherry Litweiler, as she prepares for marriage and enters into fellowship with another church family. So I'm going to share a few words and then invite Sherry to share, and then we will take part in a blessing and prayer. After that, we will sing the song that's listed in the bulletin. Church is a special and a beautiful thing as we commit to journey through life together. The love and life of Jesus forms us into a community that grows and worships, laughs and cries, serves and prays, and cares and celebrates together. We all give and receive from these relationships, and so it is appropriate to acknowledge our relationships, to give thanks, and to bless one another when the time comes for someone to move away from the community. But we also would be remiss to acknowledge the church we are all part of, no matter where we are. Though we may not see someone as often, we rejoice that we are all part of God's church, where Jesus Christ is the head and we are the body. Together in spirit, we still worship, pray, serve, and grow. And I give thanks for the ways that Sherry has contributed to our community in those areas especially. Just last week, she led us in worship, and that is something um, that I know she has done over the years. I know she is faithful in prayer for our church community. I've served alongside her in many different ways, and I'm sure that you have grown over your time here at the church, um, and you have also helped many others to grow as well. So if you would like to share. I can't do anything without notes. <laughs> As most of you know, I'm planning to marry Jeff Roth on September 9th and will be moving to his farmhouse near Morton. We plan to attend First Mennonite in Morton, where he is a member. I'm so thankful for all the teaching, support, and encouragement I've received from you all over the years. I've attended here my whole life. I've told many of you that leaving this church is the hardest thing about getting married. But I feel like I need to start going to church with Jeff to start getting to know the people there. Some people have said to him, you say you're engaged, but where is she? 
I do hope to be back here to visit occasionally and possibly to attend Mennonite women now that I'm retired. Morton isn't that far away. I will welcome your prayers as I make these transitions and I will be praying for you as well. Um, there is a blessing that's going to be on the screen. It's a responsive blessing with a prayer in the middle. So if you would join me in the people part. God, who is Alpha and Omega, we thank for you for your faithfulness in all our beginnings and ending, and for the companions you provide for us on our journey. We give thanks for the presence of Sherry Litweiler with us. Would you pray with me? God, our Father in heaven, what a joy and privilege to worship and praise you together. It is your love and your spirit that has gathered us together as a community and with all believers as your church. On this occasion, we ask your blessing on our sister Sherry. We thank you for her presence in this community and for the chance to experience growth and to worship together, to serve and pray together, to discover gifts and to share them with each other. And now as Sherry begins this transition in life, we ask for your continued presence with her. Lead her to new opportunities to serve, surround her with your love and care, and provide for all her needs. Together we ask your blessing, and if you would, please join me in the final part that's on the screen. Guide this time of transition. Prepare a home in a new community where faithfulness may continue to grow through Jesus Christ, who across time and place makes us one. Amen. Thank you. And before we sing the song um, as a blessing to each other that Sherry requested, I wanted to mention that we are sending this plant with Sherry. Um, it's aptly named a prayer plant, so that will be something that she can take with her. Kurt. Let's sing together, number 841, in Voices Together, as you go out from here. And I have to say, I never imagined using this song in this way, but thank you, Sherry. It's perfect. As you go out from here, may the Lord go with you. The face of God shine on you every day. We are sent by God wherever we are living, salt and light for people on the way. going to use this right here at this point and we're going to move into children's time and uh, one of the things that that we have to learn is this is a cone-shaped mic and if you turn it like this you're not going to hear me so I have to kind of keep it here but we have to learn to change and change comes hard sometimes and uh, one of the changes in my life guys and Weldon, you don't have yours on today, but I have my favorite new glasses. Now, I, I, I'm going to acknowledge that one of us in my family thinks they're not quite as nice as the others, but I have a pair of safety glasses that are awesome. I can now see to the side. I can see my hand waving here. I can see it over here. They're great to drive with. I can read with them on. They get dark in the sunlight. They get light in a room. Why wouldn't I wear them all the time? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> so it's so I change them. I, I I put the other pair on. And guys, last Sunday when I sat down, when I went to get up, uh, it was a little more difficult. I mean, I could I did it, but I brought my yoga pillow this morning. Now, how many in here believe that I do yoga every day? I do. And it's uh, Dr. Benkendorf's fault. 
but I did it because I needed a change. I needed to change how I was feeling. I have numbness in my legs and I have lots of things, you know, where we all get older, don't we? So anyway, as I was thinking about Elisha and Elijah today, guys, there was, I can never remember which one came first. So I thought, well, I'd look up all the guys and gals names that begin with E in the Bible. And there was a list of, I don't know, 50 or 100, great big long list. So in the long run, I thought, okay, how am I going to do this and talk about change and talk about Elisha and Elijah, because we're going to look at Elisha today. And this is how it works. Elijah has a J in it. Can you hear the J, Elijah? And, and you guys know somebody named Elijah? Well, you got a, yeah, you got, a, I think, a kind of a cousin named Elijah. Well, J comes before the S in Elisha. So Elijah came before Elisha, all right? Now, I just learned that again. And another thing I learned about change when I was reading about this story we have today was when Jesus went around his journey, he talked about change. He talked about doing things differently. He talked about learning as we grow and learning as we go. And one of the things that Elisha did in his life was he provided a small amount of food for lots and lots of people. And all of it, and I just learned that. I, I kind of missed that story in the Old Testament. Well, when Jesus did that, he followed what Elisha had done. So he's just saying yes to the things that Elijah talked about, or Elisha talked about when it comes to doing things differently. And so I was trying to think about what I did in my life that I did different. And sometimes when I, I think about my life, it's, it's 70 years old. That's a long time. I mean, hey, uh, I was in my 20s before your mom and dad were even born. Yeah, that's a long time, but it's not that long. So what in my life changed? What, what did I find that changed? Do you ever have bad dreams? Yeah, well, you know what? I decided one time I need to figure out how to change that, how to do it differently. And in, in, when I was about 20, I read a book, how you can kind of work with your dreams, just like Elisha worked with these people to make change. And I had this dream wherever, I, whenever I walked down the stairs of my dark old basement and turned to the right, there'd be a, a wolf come out. And I didn't like that at all. And I'd always go running away and I'd wake up all frustrated and, and scared. Not when I was 20, but I, I would still dream that dream. But I read once where you confront and you care about what's happening to you. So the next, I decided then the next time I had that dream, I was going to stop. I wasn't going to run. So I had that dream one night, and for some reason, I stopped. And that big dog, puppy, whatever, wolf, whatever it was that was coming out of there, stopped. It turned into a friend of mine. And you know what? I haven't dreamt that dream again. Change. That's what we're going to look at today. God asks us to change sometimes. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes we have to confront what's in front of us and work with what we have and try to figure out just how to go differently. Let's pray together. Lord, you ask us sometimes to change. You ask us sometimes to do different things differently. And we're thankful that we can as we listen to you. In Jesus' name, amen. That was a lot easier to get up this week, by the way, when I was sitting on this.
I've lost the bulletin, but I have an electronic copy in my iPad, so I'll be okay. <laughs> Jessica has prepared things for us to think about. It comes from an old, old story. It comes from a time where we, we kind of wonder what good do these stories do, these old stories in this book. But these old stories in this book, and that was another thing I learned when I was a lot younger, thankfully, that sometimes old stories have new meaning every day. And they do, don't they? Well, today we're going to learn about what happens when God's involved in conflict, when God's involved in the hard things of life, when God takes us to the places we think we shouldn't be sometimes or to the people that make us uncomfortable, or to the neighbors who, as we get to know them, we find out they're just full of lots of neat stories and lots of uh, um, things that we can learn from too. So let's share these words together. Now, the, <clears throat> the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on guard, on guard in such places. That'd be handy, wouldn't it? This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Now, now that's pretty significant because that should be the innermost place, right? Go, find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he's in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and the chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward them, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After he entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. This is quite a story, isn't it? but it has lots of good points. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them? My father, shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and they'll go, go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from the Aram, from Aram, stopped raiding Israel's territory. Lord, bless the words, the thoughts, and the wisdom we are about to hear from Jessica, as she has prepared words for us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Conflict. Ugh. Can anyone claim to be completely free from conflict? These days it seems impossible. 
In recent years, conflict has become so polarizing that there are articles published around the holidays that offer advice about how to sit and bear through a holiday meal with family members who have differing views. Now, when you think about that, it almost seems ridiculous. But then again, I know times where I've experienced that tense feeling at a family gathering, when the conversation turns to one of the many topics that has become polarized and divisive. So we need help to navigate those situations because these are the people we most often find our deepest connections to. Sometimes they are the people who formed us or they are the people that we formed and we nurtured their growth. These are important relationships. So when we feel conflicts start to rise at a family gathering, it helps to think about how we are going to handle it. Why, though, would a family meal be the source of such contention? It's like, I think, that we've attached everything to politics. So as soon as someone starts talking about one topic, most of us in our brains are making these decisions and determinations in our head about where this person sits on a variety of other topics because we've aligned opposite opinions for every topic, usually with a political party or a viewpoint. We've created this environment where everything can divide us. And so conflict is not an unusual experience in our world today, even at our family meals. But let's be honest, <clears throat> excuse me, politics and opposite opinions are not the only source of conflict. There are conflicts that stem from misunderstandings, bad relations, egos, poor communication, stubbornness, and I'm sure there are more things. Try to think of a conflict that doesn't have at least one of those factors that I've just mentioned as part of the reason for the conflict, either a reason for it coming up or a reason that it hasn't been resolved. I tried to think about that and I really couldn't. So we've been working our way off and on throughout the summer in this series of seeking peace together. In the beginning, it was focused on peace with God, then peace within, within ourselves, and now peace with others. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who, when we got to this section of the material, thought, finally, it's the real stuff. Now, I say that somewhat in jest, but conflict with each other is so much easier to identify, and it's easier to see among us. It's the kind of conflict that can easily affect relationships and a surrounding community. That's not to say that the other types of conflict can't do that, but conflict between people can do major damage. In a way, that's kind of what we're looking at in the text this morning. The story of conflict is not just difference of political opinion, it's two nations at war. But as we read in the passage, it seems as if the nation of Israel has maybe an advantage, because every move the king of Aram attempts um, is previously anticipated by Israel. He can't accomplish what he's trying to do, the king of Aram. Let's be honest, there is some unusual stuff in this story. Elisha keeps thwarting the attacks from King Aram, and we're not really sure exactly how, other than assuming divine intervention. And this makes the king of Aram upset and leads him to send out the army to capture Elisha. So Elijah and his servant wakes up and they and Elijah the servant, excuse me, goes out to find that the city is surrounded by what we assume is a surprise attack from Aram. Like anybody would, the servant is afraid, but Elisha says that's unnecessary. That what he can't see until Elijah prays for his eyes to be opened is God's fiery presence protecting them. Then, as the enemy begins to approach, Elisha prays again, and the enemy is all blinded by the light. Elisha, the very person they were trying to capture, confronts them and says, you're in the wrong spot. Let me take you on this little journey. And they end up in front of the king of Israel. They are the, the um, 
excuse me, the people from Aram are now able to see. And the king says, as he's standing there in front of them, what now? Do I kill them? To which Elijah says, no, make a feast for them and send them home. Now, really, which part of that story seems the most possible or realistic? We could describe this story with many words, like surprising, action-packed, weird, confusing, unexpected. But that doesn't take away from its helpfulness as we think about how to approach conflict. So next time we're experiencing tension in our relationships or in a full-out disagreement, should we ask God to provide chariots of fire or temporarily blind to the other person? Well, I'm guessing those requests might not turn out as helpful for our conflicts as they did in this story. But there is a key part of the story that can guide us. Should I kill them, the king asks. Do not kill them. Provide a meal for them. I feel pretty confident saying that none of us have been in a conflict where we have asked, should I kill them? But that doesn't mean that we haven't harmed another with our own thoughts and actions. Like it is referenced throughout the story, when we are in conflict, we don't fully see. We can be blind to another person's perspective. We can be blind to truth that we don't want to admit is true. We can be blind to the feelings and experiences of another person. We can be blind to our own wrongdoing. We can be blind to the nature of God in which we were each created. And we can be blind to the presence of God with us. Like Elisha's servant, the blindness or inability to fully see, which we experience in conflict, closes us off from creative peacemaking opportunities. And from that, we might feel as if the conflict is just how it's going to be. There is no transformation or resolution possible. We'll just stay mad. The battles will continue in the war we're fighting. But this is not the idea of staying in the conflict that we are getting at today. We're not staying in our conflict so that we can keep trying to prove ourselves right. We can stay in the conflict in a different way. We can ask God to open our eyes so that we can see. What we need to see is God's presence with us, God with us. And as I'm sure you know, that's exactly what one of the names we use to describe Jesus means, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is God with us. Not only that, but Jesus is described as the light, kind of like in reference to this story where God is the light, the blinding light. The Apostle John described Jesus as the light in his gospel book near the beginning, chapter 1, verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus himself tells a crowd in John chapter 12, beginning at verse 44, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light. These are just little snippets of references to Jesus as the light. And I'll just include one more um, that comes from Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 6, it says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Too often we are tempted to try to fix our conflicts on our own. But let's not be blinded to see God's presence with us. Seeing the light of Jesus as we experience conflict is going to change something. Is it going to change the other person? Probably not. Is it going to change the conflict? Not likely. Is it going to change us? I sure hope so. Jesus changes us. He is the light of God's presence with us. He showed us how to be in right relationship with other people and with God 
So we've got to look to him, especially when we're in conflict. And something we'll find when we look to Jesus is that he doesn't always deal with things the way that we might. Many of us want to run away from conflict or fight back with aggression. But Jesus does things differently. As you read through the stories of Jesus, you quickly see, especially in the book of Luke, that the idea of eating with people that some might call enemies is not unusual for Jesus. He ate with betrayers, crooked teachers, prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners, which I use in quotations because that is how we can all be described. When we eat a meal, it is an opportunity for the playing field to be leveled, for us to take a breath, for all present to share something in common, the time, the experience, the taste, the food. I think this is something Jesus knew, and it might be why it was so important for him to experience meals with a variety of people. In a similar vein, in the book of Romans, chapter 12, Paul wrote, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone, which is our Bible memory verse this month. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Remember from the story today, the army of Aram is unexpectedly standing in front of the king of Israel, and he asks, shall I kill them? Here they are, enemy in front of enemy. What is one to do? Feed them. Give them something to drink. What is really beautiful about this story is that the king doesn't just give them food and water. The text says that he prepared a feast for them. I think this could be foreshadowing to so many things, but most prominently to me would be the banquet that we anticipate when heaven and earth are reunited, as told by the prophet Isaiah, when we can all be at the table. As we think about all of this, the story from Second Kings, two conflicting parties and feasting together, there are two connections I want to share with you that helps us see the possibilities for peacemaking at the table. First is the story of an experimental restaurant in London called Conflict Cafe. It was a month-long pop-up restaurant organized by a London-based peace-building charity called International Alert. They began the effort in 2014 and, from what I could find out, continued it at least until 2019. The idea was that the Conflict Cafe would use food as a vehicle for dialogue on conflict and peace building. The Conflict Cafe began as a way to engage people out of touch with the conflicts happening around the world. So while it's a little different, it wasn't two enemies sitting down in this tension that they're feeling and disagreement. It was a chance to bring people together in a room and engage them in conversation about food and the cultures behind it. But it's not just that simple. This was not just a casual conversation. International Alert, the organization that formed this, was deliberate in its attempts to weave the histories of foreign conflicts and peace-building efforts to resolve them as the people enjoyed a meal together. Practically, how does this work? Well, they have a chef that's native from each area, prepare traditional foods, and people come, they sit at communal tables with strangers, and they have multiple choice questions about the conflict um, on the table to begin conversation for the night. 
And then they have specialists share history of the conflict and explain attempts at peace by both government and non-government organizations in between the different courses of the meal. And while this might sound like there's going to be a sales pitch coming, that um, you know by dessert they'll ask diners to sign up to help, that's not the case. Even though there is no call to action, it does not mean that this evening does nothing. Two big accomplishments happen. First, 50 or so diners invest in peacemaking by giving their evening to this experience. And second, they're not even just giving their time, they're giving their money to pay to participate in this. If you can get people to see the value in doing this and make time in their schedule to engage with conflict, that alone is a show of solidarity for peace. And it all begins with a meal. And the second connection that I want to make for us this morning um, has to do with, um, it's not actually a real life example of peacemaking at the table. It's a song that I had playing in my head throughout this whole week as I was getting ready for this message. So I'm not going to play this song with you um, for you this morning, but I do want to share the message of it. It's actually called Piecemeal, and it's by Brian Moyer Suderman. The song could be a sermon time on its own throughout the lyrics of each verse and chorus. So I'm going to kind of go through those a little bit. Verse 1, he tells a biblical story of a meal that created peace, Nabal's wife showing hospitality in the middle of a conflict. The next verse, he shares about an establishment local to him where all are welcome to enjoy a meal, no matter what differences there are. The third verse remembers the promise of God providing a peace meal with our enemies at the table, just like it's written about in Psalm 23. And then finally, in verse 4, he sings, Sometimes I am angry, sometimes I'm in pain. Sometimes there is someone that I'd rather not see again. Sometimes I can catch a glimpse of something hard to see. In the cup and broken bread, new possibilities. Because it's a piecemeal. In this last verse, that it just really brings it together for me. Sometimes we are angry and in pain and we don't want to see somebody again. But if we can take that step to share a meal, Maybe we'll find out that it's not just the bread that is broken, that maybe our tension, our pain, our anger, all of those things can also be broken. Like the chorus of the song repeats over and over, it's a piecemeal, a piecemeal, a table set, don't you hear the call? A piecemeal, a piecemeal, a table set for us all. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for your word and the common place of a table, that it is a place where Jesus frequented and ate with a variety of people. Open our eyes to your presence around us and especially in the conflicts that we are experiencing. Help us to seek peace and be open to the creative ways we can do that as we follow Jesus every day of our lives. In his name we pray, amen. We're going to sing together number 150 in uh, Voices Together. Um, I first heard this two weeks ago at uh, 9.15, and you probably did if you were sitting here, Marcio played it uh, as part of Prelude, the first song. And uh, I first heard the music, and it's a little challenging, so Lori's going to play it for us, but I also, um, the song is written by two women from New Zealand, and they have a way with the English language that you'll probably have to sit and think about this a while um, for it to come home, kind of like the, the story that uh, Jessica talked about. Let's sing this together. Gentle God, when we are driven past the limits of our love.
Gentle God, when we are driven past the limits of our love, when our hurt would have a weapon and the dark destroyed a dove, at the cost of seeming weak, help us turn the other cheek. Gentle spirit, when our reason clouds in anger twists in fear, when we strike instead of scolding, when we bruise with sing and spear, cool our burning, take our pain, bring us to ourselves again. In the mirror of our sadness, let us see our ravaged face. In the turmoil of the people, let compassion find a place. Touch our hearts to make amends, see our enemies as friends. Let our strength be in forgiving, as forgiven we must be. One to one in costly loving, finding trust and growing free. Gentle God, be our release. Gentle Spirit, teach us peace. I think as I listened to the sharing that happened this morning and the wisdom that came from this book, there's a reason they call it the Holy Bible, isn't there? Yeah. There wasn't a misprint in the, the bulletin. The uh, worship leader took freedom and, and wanted to move the offering time prayer into the uh, sharing time. And uh, I neglected to have that changed. So that's my fault not anybody else's. As we met and listened this morning, I was reminded of several things around us that wouldn't it be wonderful if we could sit down and have a meal together with that person or with that group. It might begin change. I would like to take time for the offering prayer Miracle working God, we offer you a bit of our time, a little of our money. We make these offerings in hope, which usually means we hope that just a bit of good, a little kindness will come from these gifts. But today, as we consider your fiery protection and the table spread for enemies, we make these offerings in a more ridiculous kind of hope that you will act in your mighty power, which we can scarcely see to, an accomplish, to accomplish an impossible peace. We pray this foolish prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As I prepared today, some of the words that were thrown out here in some of these prayers bothered me a little. But as you think about it, it surely seemed foolish in the story today to trust God to take no revenge, to take an initiative of creating further relationship. Seems kind of foolish, doesn't it? But it's this foolishness that God wants us to trust. And I think we've learned that many times, haven't we? 
as we've journeyed. You know, we have a Bible memory verse. I think I could almost recite from memory, finally. <laughs> but it is full of everything we've talked about today. Let's share that verse together. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Romans 12, 18. Kurt? As our sending song today, we're going to uh, join together number 813, Heart with Loving Heart United. Heart with loving heart united, met to know God's holy will. Let this love in us ignited, more and more our spirits fill. He the head, we are his members, we reflect the light he is. He the master, we disciples, he is ours and we are his. May we also love each other and our selfish claims deny, so that each one for the other will not hesitate to die. Even so our Lord has loved us, for our lives he shed his life. Still he grieves and still he suffers for our selfishness and strife. Since, O oh Lord, you have demanded that our lives your love should show, so we wait to be commanded forth into your world to go. Kindle in us love's compassion, so that everyone may see in our fellowship the promise of a new humanity. For a benediction, hear these words. Go forth in the strong vulnerability of the Creator, the wise foolishness of Jesus Christ, and the sure uncertainties of the Holy Spirit. Know that the powerful presence of God surrounds you, and the holy table is set for us all. Go in peace. <laughs>